Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our fall teaching summit. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. We've had a lot of positive comments from everyone about Pia and Lynn and Henry, and obviously the theme of coaching, and you know a lot of after after seminar discussions and over dinner um, discussions about uh, converting ourselves from teachers to coaches and uh, how we're going to go about that. So hopefully you got a lot out of yesterday. I think you're going to get a lot out of today. We got three presentations in here this morning that I think will be very helpful you know, um, for you both as a business person and as an instructor. And then after lunch we go outside and we have uh, three hours with uh, the great Mr. Billy Harmon. So this morning, first up, is growing the game, growing your business. We have a couple people here who amplify um, exactly that. Um, Nikki Gatch, who worked for the section for over a decade, as she says, um, she is now, her official title, is Player Development Regional Manager for the PJ of America, and that's the Southern California market, and actually she just went over to the Aloha section to work with their ED and, and do some training and some education over there. So pretty significant position you know, with the PGA of America and certainly an important one as far as growing the game. You know, Nikki's a PGA member. She worked as an assistant professional here at Mission Hills and at Keogh Island. Um, as I mentioned, she did work for the Southern California PGA. In 2013, she was named the WSCGA Golf Professional of the Year. And she was also inducted into the SCPGA Junior Golf Hall of Fame. A lot of you know Nikki, a lot of you know her husband, Don, and just a pleasure to have Nikki with us this morning. With Nikki is Lawrence Gilbert. Lawrence has a story to tell, which they will go over this morning, a success story and how to basically create something out of nothing at a club that he was at and has established himself there as a, a very, very important part of that operation because of what he did growing the game. He's a PJ member, he's a director of player development at Coda the Cause of Golf and Racquet Club, uh, the recipient of the 2013 SCPJ Player Development Award, and he's a member of the Southern California PJ Player Development Committee, as well as the Junior Golf Committee. So without further ado, Nikki Gatch and Lawrence Gilbert. Great day yesterday, and hopefully you had a nice evening here in the desert. Uh, Lawrence and I are thrilled to be here. Just want to thank Bill and the teaching committee for including us in what I think is is one of our best programs that we do uh, as a section, uh, the teaching summit. Uh, I used to work alongside Bill putting this on, and it was always a highlight of our year. So, Bill, thank you uh, for including us and including player development. It seems like that that's been a theme um, so far in the summit about not only growing the game but but growing your, your business and validating your value as a PGA professional. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And you know, we didn't want this to be a presentation. It's going to be more of a conversation. And Lawrence and I are just going to talk, and you guys are going to listen in. And uh, it is rock. But I wanted to, to share you know, Lawrence's story and what he's done. You know, I think it, it has a lot more value if you hear from one of your peers as to how they've accomplished success um, in, the, in the player development realm opposed to me standing up here talking about programs and how great they are. Of course, I will always continue to do that, so you're not off the hook. But a couple things that we want to cover today in our, in our presentation on growing the game and growing your business, the importance of understanding who your customer or your student is, and then understanding what programs they want, and providing them with those programs, and then, of course, marketing those programs, because no one's going to sign up for programs if you don't market it tell them what's going on. And then finally, the importance of tracking what you're doing with your player development. And those are four important keys to the success of having a, a, a great player development program, the successful facilities that I've seen, especially since being in this role almost three years now, they have accomplished all four of those. And Lawrence certainly is, is one of those professionals, so I'd like, to, I'd like for him to share that story with you. Uh, before we start, you know, some of you, most of you don't know Lawrence, but those of you that do know Lawrence um, probably don't know that being a PGA professional is actually his third career. And I thought it was important for him to kind of tell that story and share some of his background because as you'll, as you'll hear from him, that really helped him in becoming the PGA professional that he is. So, Lawrence, 
Um, love what you do. That's what my mom said to me when, when I was young and when I was looking for work. Always love what you do because you're going to do it for a long time. Uh, sometimes a job is a means to an end. So in other words, you do your day job so you can do your night job, something you enjoy. I've done that many times. Others were very important in terms of growth and what I've done. Uh, some of my positions that I've had, careers that I've had, was a chef. Uh, started out of school, uh, went to college for it for two years, uh, and it taught me organization. It taught me how to give the customer exactly what they want. Um, if someone orders a steak well done and wants ketchup on it, you're pouring the ketchup on for them, whatever they want. Keep them coming back, it doesn't matter. Then I was a stockbroker. I did that for a while. I did it before uh, really computers were around. I mean, there were computers, but not everyday computers were around. Uh, and that taught me how to make a decision, but most of all, perseverance, uh, staying with it. Uh, I did have to cold call. I don't know if anyone knows about stockbrokers, but you have to do a lot of cold calling. So you make 100 calls to get one person that wants to hear from you again. Then out of those one, one person, you need a hundred of those to get someone to send you money over the phone. So you're making lots of calls. I remember having three phones in front of me just calling. And then when someone answered, you pick it up. Very, very difficult, but still taught me a lot. And the one uh, job that I had, I wouldn't consider this a career, but the one job that I had was uh, customer service at a bank. This was the one that I disliked the most, but it taught me the best, the best lesson, which was uh, how to handle irate people. Because who calls a bank all happy? Everything's perfect, thank you. It doesn't happen. So it taught me a great lesson, and I, and I really look back fondly on that, even though I hate every minute of it. I remember when I left, I cried because I was so happy that it happened. <laughs> But, um, and then my, one of my favorite careers uh, was a professional poker player. I did that for about three years, and that taught me how to read people, you know, to make sure that I knew they were having fun or uncomfortable or whatever it was. But it taught me patience. You can't play every hand, right? You gotta be cool. Uh, my transition from poker player, because I was pretty quite fulfilled with that, it was a different lifestyle. Um, my, my wife knew I was interested in changing, and she was watching a TV show, and she wanted me to watch it. It was called, I Want to Be a, and that week it just happened to be a golf professional. So I was watching it, and at the end of it, I looked at her and I said, that's me. That's my career right there. And from that day, 28 days later, I had the job of prototyping golf and racket golf. Perseverance. Sticking with it, cold calling every single club within 50 miles of my house, just to make sure that I got what I wanted. So I worked for six years as uh, a golf professional, and my director of golf knew that I was ready. I didn't want to be in the shop anymore. I wanted to teach, and I wanted to make a difference and give lessons and do everything. And he said, well, if you wanted to go teach, but come up with something, write something up, uh, develop a position. And so I came up with Director of Player Development. And to me, the Director of Player Development is a lot more than just lessons. It's about making uh, a member feel comfortable where they are. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people come into a country club not knowing what to do, not knowing how to check in, not knowing where the facilities are. When I go down to the range, who can I hit next to this person? You know, they really don't know these things. We take that for granted. Uh, and so, um, what I did was I spent that time every day just trying to make people feel comfortable. And that's how I looked at it, and I love doing that. And that's really yeah. the joy of what I do. That's great. How about that story? <laughs> so, you know, I've been in the section for over a decade, as Bill mentioned, and I thought I had a really good uh, handle on all of our professionals and what everyone was doing. And, I had no idea this guy even exists. 
right? And so when I, when I first met Lawrence at Toto, he had just started um, in, in the new role, and, and we were trying to work things out and, and you know, work together and, and go through it. But my gosh, what a, what a treasure I just found under a rock. Here's Lawrence that nobody even knew. And now I'm just so thrilled that you know, he won the Player Development Award. We're now getting involved in our section a little bit more. Well, what I think makes a difference is I love what I do. I mean, it's not a job, really. It's, right. I'm not trying to preach or anything like that, but it really is calling me. Well, Personal. it shows, and, and that's why you're, that's, that's part of the reason that you're so successful. <coughs> so let's dive into some of your programs. And I think what's great about, about uh, the programs that Lawrence has created is that he really, and this goes to you know knowing who your customer is and, and providing programs that they want. And so as he analyzed the club, you know, there, were, there were a few areas that he saw had the greatest opportunity. One was juniors. He had a lot, he had a lot of juniors in the club, but no real substantial organized program. Uh, a lot of families in the club, so that was certainly an area of great opportunity. And the non-golfers' uh, non uh, spouses <coughs> of members, certainly a huge opportunity there. I mean, you reached out to some of the social members, lots of social members. Um, and then also, he didn't forget about his core golfers. You know, a lot of times when we talk about growth of the game, the first thing that comes to your mind is those beginners that most of you I know don't like to work with, and that's okay. Uh, junior golf, you know, and that's certainly part of it, but we can't forget about our core golfers. You know, if, you can, if you have a member that maybe plays twice a week, if you can somehow convince him or her to play three or four times a week, everybody wins in the long run. Get to that a little bit later about how you didn't neglect those, those core golfers, um, and specifically those, those men golfers mm -hmm. in the club that were playing three, four, sometimes five times a week. Um, you know, how do you do player development for that group? And, and this guy figured it out. So <coughs> well, talk about that. And it's the same with junior golfers. If you get the junior golfers out playing, and they're going to say to their parents, "Let's go play golf," then they're not going to play. So right. And so you are part of the club. You want to create that atmosphere that they want to come to the club. Okay, we can't forget the fact that these people have paid a lot of money to belong to this club. You know, we can't forget the fact that if you're not in a private club, that these people are choosing to spend their money as entertainment with you and your facility. So we can't ever lose sight of that. We have to provide a, a welcoming, fun, social atmosphere um, that, that obviously includes golf. Let's let's talk about juniors first. Um, what I needed to do as I was, as I became director of player development, I needed to find where there was a need. And what I came up with was non-summer junior programs. Uh, we did a great job with our junior programs during the summer. We did camps like everybody does. Very successful, you know, between 15 and 30 kids each week. It was very, very good. Um, in our tournaments, I did a FedEx Cup tournament, which would last all summer and would end right on uh, uh, Labor Day, and uh, very, very exciting. Uh, but what I, we needed was a year-long program. That's what I was looking for. Have the kids out all year long, not just when um, summer was here. Uh, so I came up with two different styles of clinics. Um, and these clinics, uh, in the back, I have the brochure if you want to take a look at it. It'll explain what they are, but I'm going to explain them now. There's two different styles of clinics. One was uh, a range clinic, which is always age appropriate. Very important because we want it to be social. Uh, it would deal with swing mechanics uh, and good sport movements. Um, the way I broke down the range clinics, hour long, a third of it would be good sport movements, the first part. We do some stretching, we do this, and I do a lot of uh, work with the PGA Junior Sports Academy. Um, and I really love this. If you're not sure what it is, take a look at it on the, on the website. Yeah, and it, what's great about the Sports Academy, can anybody integrate the PGA Sports Academy in their junior program? Okay, a couple. So what's great about it is, is you can take bits and pieces like Lawrence has mm -hmm. and integrate that into his existing program. There's also a, a progression program that you can follow that has you know, different manuals and books for the kids uh, to follow. So there's a couple different options utilizing that. But really, you 
specializing more in athletic needs, yeah. keeping it fun, talking about the importance of health and fitness and nutrition, mm -hmm. all, all of the, the well-rounded things that, that we need to incorporate, not only for our juniors, but for our adults as well. Yeah. Some pros have, have taken that over to the, the adult program as well. Huge. And the three, <laughs> the three that I would mostly work with was nutrition and hydration, teaching the kids how to eat and drink on course, off course, uh, when you're coming up to uh, a tournament, make sure you eat, eat almost every three holes, that type of thing. Uh, then they have a, what's called a dribble station. All the kids love soccer. I never played soccer. Did you play soccer? I did. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm officially a soccer mom. Oh, a soccer mom. Whether I like it or not. <laughs> and I, uh, I never played soccer, but the kids love it. And so what we do is we set up an obstacle course. Mm -hmm. So you can do it as a uh, competition, you can do it as just time, or you can just do it just for the fun of it, but it teaches them how to maneuver a course, stay balanced, stay controlled. Very, very important, very good thing. And then the other is balance, throw, and catch. You have an elevated plank, and the kids walk across that, balancing, and you throw golf balls at them as they're doing this. You have them throw a football. Uh, just movements while they're balancing and walking, throwing, all this good stuff. Uh, absolutely love that. Uh, the PGA Junior Sports Academy, so check it out. Very, very good. Uh, the other type of, uh, oh, as you go, uh, the good sport movements. The, uh, the other third uh, is learning a new swing fundamental. So we have a warm up to start, then we have learning a new swing fundamental, uh, which could be anything, uh, anything at all, whatever you want to decide. We'd like to make it progressive, so you know, it could work on finish, it could work on this, anything, doesn't matter. And then the final third of the clinics, that I do a third of it, is uh, competitions. These kids love competitions. So what we'll do is we'll have a competition utilizing whatever that learned skill was that day. Uh, whether it's chipping and we try to get closest to the hole, if it's chipping again and we're trying to play horse, anything like that, a lot of fun. Uh, and then the other type of clinic that I have is on course. On course is just what it is. We go out an hour and a half and we play as many holes as we can. No mechanics, nothing like that. Just playing, having fun. Love that. love that. They love that. Absolutely. Uh, very popular and, um, and and it's amazing. It's amazing how fun it is for me too. Yeah, I think too many times in our junior programs we're just restricting to the driving range. Oh yeah. No. The driving green. And that's important, but I think I can see how they could really appreciate. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Right. Pretty good. Uh, but I always try to tell them that this is not golf. Driving range, chipping area is not golf. As you get better, we know the importance of it, but as you're starting out, a real golf is on the course. Uh, but there's two different ways that you go about it. With the younger kids, with everyone, it's have fun. That seems to be the theme. But with the younger kids, especially, have fun. You want them to keep coming back. You want to hear the parents say, my daughter or my son asked me this morning to come to the driving range. Oh, they love that. Parents love that. Getting my money's worth at those. It's perfect. Uh, some of the things I do for fun is, for the younger kids, is we have a water station. And I bring uh, that as uh, water enhancers. So you have uh, all these different flavors, and they mix and match. And Someone put all of them in, and they drink, and they have fun, and it's terrific. Uh, the other thing that I do that they don't really notice, but they appreciate, I'm sure, is that I make the course more manageable. I uh, basically play from a 100-yard marker in on every hole. Um, I set up tee boxes for these special tees for them that we have, and uh, I'll have them there and be like, these are your tees. You know, tee off from the reds or the whites or whatever it is. Oh, it isn't easy. No, of course it's an easy course to go. Even from 100 yards in. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, so it, it works out good. The older kids, though, they want competition. They want it to be fun, but they want, they're want they a little more serious. And uh, what I do is I have a monthly tournament. Uh, anyone that goes into my clinics, any one of these clinics throughout the month, is eligible to play. Uh, and it's a perpetual trophy. So we have one trophy. He takes it home. The winner takes it home for the month. They bring it back, they hopefully they defend. And some of the most intense putts you can even imagine. I remember 
remember one kid, he had a six footer to win, and uh, he made it and he went down and down. <laughs> and he just couldn't believe it. He was just so happy. Yeah. And I, it was just a lot of fun and really, really cool to see the juniors uh, do that type of stuff. One thing I take from this is that there's a really nice progression, you know, whether it's that kid that's, you know, they're putting the club in his or her hand for the first time, or that, that competitive kid that, you know, falls on the ground because he won the trophy. Yeah. So that, that's so important. How important do you think that is to have, you know, that progression, progressive model uh, for the kids? Well, I would say it's probably the most important thing, yeah. without question. I do think, though, for kids, it's re relatively easy to be progressive because they're growing, they're changing, they're getting stronger, they're getting ability to concentrate longer, and, and it's easy to progress. For adults, it's a lot harder. Yeah. I, I think as a whole, we've done a really good job of, of creating a progressive model for juniors because, mm -hmm. like you said, it is easier. It's much you know, they're, they're advancing so quickly, they, mm -hmm. they need that next step. And, and kids love that next step. You know, they, they want to master this and move on to the next, just just like any other sport or like in karate, they, they're trying to get that next color belt. Yeah. But I think what, what's really important, and we'll, we'll talk about this, is also having that same progressive model for your adults. Because adults want the same thing as well. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a professional or, or a facility, and you know, they did a great job with you know, with, with the program, or let's say get golf ready, for example. So that through their five lessons or four or five lessons, and then there's nothing else for them, you know. And, and the pro expects them to be ready to, to go play play golf and, and be a you know a green fee paying customer, and they're just not quite ready. I think that was that was mentioned yesterday afternoon, and, and he was exactly right. You know, um, I didn't agree with the get golf ready doesn't work, and we're gonna we're gonna prove that. Um, but if you don't have something for those people to move into that next step, then we may lose them. And I think that's been, that's been part of our challenge. So uh, it is important to have that progressive model, not only for juniors, but for adults. Yeah. Uh, and with that, let's, let's talk about how you handle uh, the adults of the club. Well, as I was there for uh, six years at the time, and uh, we never really had much success when it came to uh, tournaments. We would... Uh, and I don't think it was due to bad instruction, anything like that. I just think it was more of a platform issue. Uh, so I was searching for a program that would let me do this, would let me educate people, but in a fun environment and things like that. So my director of golf told me about Get Golf Ready. He knew about it, he didn't really know the, all the details. Uh, so I did my research and I absolutely loved it. I realized that. I could customize it, I could make it my own, I could do anything I want with it. I could have it as long as I wanted, as short as I wanted, it doesn't matter. And um, so Get Golf Ready, if anyone doesn't know, hopefully you all know, but uh, there's five one hour lessons, group lessons, for $99. It's affordable, it's easy, and for me it's good because you get five, six, seven people in a class paying basically $25 each. Fantastic. Um, well, hundred bucks for each lesson. Right, right. That's hour. where. That's where. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love what you pointed out that you can customize. I don't think enough of uh, our professionals realize that. But here's the, the base model, if you will, of Get Golf Ready. You can make it whatever you like. And I'm sure a lot of you are doing your own version of Get Golf Ready. You're not just you're just not branding it Get Golf Ready, which is fine. Um, if you're at a, a public facility and nobody else chose to. Utilize that national branding of it, and I, I think that can really be a positive. But you can make it what you want. We have some facilities that, that do three lessons, and others make them a little bit longer. You can certainly charge more, charge less. Um, that doesn't happen too often, but you can certainly charge more. Um, you chose to go with ninety nine dollars. Yeah, I go ninety nine dollars, but I uh, I put it to four lessons instead of okay. five because I wanted to go monthly. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't realize that we would start, you know, this day, that day, it wouldn't really be, I wanted to do first of the month, end of the month, we knew when it was going to start. Uh, that didn't work out, so, but still, four the day, four classes is perfect. Uh, and, and I think this program basically targets beginners, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and a lot of my uh, clients that I have, or people that I get, are social members, are 
uh, non-members, uh, friends of people that are taking the class, that's the best way to do it, is if they're enjoying themselves, they invite a friend and say, hey, this is great. Or if they get up to a certain level, my friend plays golf, but I'm not as good as they are. They can take a couple of these classes, all of a sudden they're better, or just as good, then they do it. So yeah. very, very exciting. So what I did was I talked it up to all my members, uh, to the five hour, about four hour long classes, and it really, really, really to me seemed like an easy set. I figured I'd get probably eight to ten people doing it, but I only got two, so it was kind of disappointing. Uh, but I didn't cancel. I made sure, well, I just wanted to go through with it, and I knew it would be a long process. So I want to emphasize that. Because this is something that I hear a lot as well. You know, oh well, yeah, we tried to get golf ready, but it didn't work. You know, we only had one person sign up, or two people signed up. So I commend you for just yeah. going forward, and you probably gave those two people the best time that they had and, and the best instruction that they had. had. And, and I know I'll, I'll let you tell them how you how you do that. But I just wanted to emphasize that point that we had a plan, we created the program. Executing the program, no matter if you have two people sign up or 200, and you'll see, as, as he explains, where, where he's taking it. 200 would have been really nice. <laughs> so I would have been real happy with that. Right. That would have been a success. So, uh, the two people, and what we would do is um, we would start out from the beginning how to check <coughs> in, how to leave your bag at backdrop. I know we take that for granted, but a lot of people don't know how to. So there was Social members, yeah. These were last, these were no, not, not last golfers, but these were spouses. Mm -hmm. And they didn't play golf, so they really didn't know about this. Hardly ever at the club, that type of thing. Uh, so, taught them how to check in, how to deal with the locker rooms were, understanding the backdrop, driving range, etiquette. Oh, there's too many people on the putting green. No, you can use them, you can share all it's okay. Just, you know, don't cross their line, you know, whatever. Right. Things like that. Uh, and, um, but then, as far as instruction, I worked from the hole back. Started with putting, then chipping for the next week, irons, and then finally ending with drivers. And they loved it. And at the end of the last class, I gave each person a diploma of, of completion. It was kind of goofy, but they enjoyed it. It was like, fun. It was, it was fun. Like yeah. Again, you progress a little bit. Yeah. But I signed it, the director of golf signed it. It was really, it was very cool. And I also brought some champagne. And so we're on the driving range, finishing with real champagne flutes, not paper cups or anything, but it was posted. It is and, photo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and popped open the champagne right in the driving range, and uh, we drank and celebrated. And I was happy, and they threw me a curveball, though. They said, what are we going to do next week? <laughs> Right. <laughs> talking about it next week. I mean, there's going to be new people coming in. You don't want to do it again. But I realized that I need to make something progressive. And that was perfect. So I went home that night. I told him to come back next week. We'll have something. And something. we'll figure something out. And I came up with a progressive program. So get golf ready one, the games. Basically, the games. Get golf ready two takes. Is more an advanced get golf ready one. You go into a little bit more detail, you go over a little more fundamentals, it's not just basics, it's how to think a little bit, getting involved in that. But it's also good for golfers that are that have specific issues that play, that are good players. I have uh, get golf ready two where I just work on putting for the four weeks. It's amazing how that helps someone. Just driving for distance. All we do is work on drivers. Ninety-nine dollars to fix your car. It's pretty easy, you know. And uh, and then the third get golf ready three is only done on the course. So all I do is play course management. Course management how do we get them comfortable out there if they if they're going from get golf ready one to if some of the ladies are more advanced and they want to learn about proper strategies, how to play par fives, when to lay up, when to be aggressive. So that's uh, that's something that's really really important. Um, but all I wanted was to create something that these people wouldn't grow out of. And I actually, one of the ladies, one of the two ladies that did it originally with me is still with me, and she just 
shot a 90 with pellets in hand. Wow. So from she started as two, a kid. Yeah, two and a half years ago, and she shot 90 with pellets in hand, which yeah, was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. But it was very exciting. She came back, and champagne was flowing. It was great. Uh, so, so I had the program, but I didn't have the people just yet. Okay. So I talked to everyone that I encountered, and I kept talking it up. So the first month I had two people, as we know. The second month was four. Double, it's good. The third month was very exciting because I got ten people. Yeah, I was really excited. But the big thing about that was that two of the people brought friends. So to me, that's huge. If you're doing something and you bring someone, that means you really, really like it. Or you like whatever it is. Uh, and within six months, I had 30 people doing Get Golf Ready, which basically brings in $3,000 a month in just Get Golf Ready revenues. It's great. Yeah, it's great. So talk about marketing. We've got, we've got a, an example of the brochure that you created that you know, basically covers all of the programs that he offers you know, in a nice brochure. We do have a few. We unfortunately don't have enough for everybody, but if you'd like to take a look or even take one, on the back table there by the water. Uh, you talked about you know, word of mouth, and not only word of mouth from clearly your customers, for them bringing their friends, and I know you were, the club allows you to bring your non members as mm -hmm. well, which is huge. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while when we talk about the revenue scorecard and the impact that had on new members and, and things like that. And then, you know, reaching out to your social members um, is, is great, and, and word of mouth for, for you. I've never seen anyone that can promote his programs as good as Lawrence does. And that's important, um, again, because people aren't going to sign up for a program if they don't know that it exists. You know, I, see that, I see that all too often of, yeah, we tried it and nobody signed up for it. And then we really start digging deep into, well, how did you market the program? And then realize it's this flyer that was created on Word. It doesn't look very professional. Not, no graphics, no color. And it's just hung up somewhere in the, in the golf shop or the locker room. Well, if it's a get golf ready or a, or a beginner type of class, those people probably aren't walking through the golf shop yet or, or going in the locker room. So one thing I wanted to talk about, um, another resource that's available to you on PGA Links is our Marketing Resource Center. Has anybody taken a look at that yet? We're constantly making improvements to it. We started it probably about six or eight months ago, and we're constantly uh, updating it. But this, to me, is probably one of the best things that our association has done for us. You know, we, we are great at growing the game, we're great at teaching the game, we're great at running our operations. Not all of us, there's certainly exceptions, but not all of us are marketing experts. And this will help us. And not all of us have the luxury of having a marketing department at your facility or within your management company uh, or whatever where you can just say, hey, I need a flyer for my class you know, you can create this or sometimes if you do have that luxury sometimes it's not real high on that marketing person's priority list unfortunately so this is a tool and we're not that we don't have time to run through all of it but i encourage you to take a look at it there's professional uh, photographs graphics templates for anything that you can imagine from a simple flyer to a poster a, a banner you can put on your website cart signs um, and there's also things in there to help you not only uh, player development programs, but golf shop sales uh, in, your, in your shop, uh, tournaments coming up, anything like that. So I really encourage you to, to take a look at that. The one thing before we, before we wrap up the adult programming, you know, obviously we've got the juniors covered, we've got the beginners, and, and the women covered at the club. And, and one thing that I, that I found that was really pretty amazing about Lawrence is that he realized that he couldn't, that there was a group at the club that he, that he was neglecting. And I think all of you can probably relate to this, but that's his core golfers, and specifically the men at the club. You know, those guys that are, that are playing three, four, five times a week, they've got their own game, they've got their money games going on. You know, how, how do you integrate player development with that group? You know, I think that's something that, that probably a lot of us can relate to, especially those of you at, at private facilities. And Lawrence did a great job of, of figuring out how to do that, and how to get them a little bit more involved in some programs. So I'd love for you to share what you did uh, for yeah, very interesting. Uh, I found that most of the, oh, actually all of the participants were women. And uh, I needed to figure out how to get the men in there. And I always
always market to men, you know, talk to them about it. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sounds good, sounds good. And we're, they're, they're too good. Yeah, they're too right? good for that. You don't need that. Like, all right. So I was talking to one of my members who says, you know, if you come up with something, you know, where you can hang out with friends and, you know, have a beer, relax, have something fun, make it social, that might sound good. It got me thinking. I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. So what I came up with was, I didn't call it Get Golf Ready, but in my mind I did. But Get Golf Ready Cigars and Comrades. So what we do is, I set up chairs. There you go. There it is. I set up chairs and couches down on the range and create a spectacle. That's part of marketing. People, I got tons of questions about this. What were you doing down there? What were you smoking? Or, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't Why were you smoking down there? And, uh, and it was fun. And I got, uh, so what we, the premise of it was we learn something, whatever it is, it doesn't matter on the range. And these are that, players. oh, these are good players. No, these were all very accomplished oh, players. I'd say, I'd say, yeah, probably like, not quite scratch, scratch but fives and tens right in there. So good place, yeah, absolutely. And um, we had the cigars, and you can see, I think there's a, there's a bottle of Hennessy <coughs> right there. And it, we drank, and we learned, and we sat there for about three hours talking, and it was amazing. And those three guys now, see the, the gentleman, right, the two gentlemen in front, and then the guy in the blue sweater, all play together now, and they never knew each other. They play every week right. because of that. Yeah. One, and, uh, and it's amazing. Uh, but what we had was, in three weeks, I had 10 guys committing to four hour-long classes. Right. What's that? How much, how much do you charge? And I charged, well, I undercharged, but I didn't know any better. $75 <laughs> 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 for each lesson, for each one. And it was low, but for what they got, it was great. And I just wanted to work out the kinks and make sure it worked. And, and it did, by all means. You can see me there laughing. I was drinking apple juice. I was not drinking Hennessy, just so you know, because I was on the clock. <laughs> Believe that is crazy. Okay? So, but recently, as an example, recently I, uh, I worked with Pat Burke. I don't know if anyone knows Pat Burke, but he works at our place. And he was on tour for a while. And it was Get Golf Ready Cigars and Cognac with a tour pro. And I was able to get nine people, and we charged two hundred and fifty dollars a piece for three yeah. hours worth each person. You'd be surprised how many how much people we had. But what we did was we did the cigars, we did the cognac, we did uh, a clinic. He worked with them a little bit. I worked with them, and then we actually went out and played a hole. And I'd say the best part was that Pat shows me. <coughs> This, this is how I would play it because the pins in this way hits it. And this is a par five over water, second shot, you know, uh, south number three. And uh, he hits a hybrid, it's about 220 yard carry, hits a hybrid in the, in the bunker behind the green. Everyone else is playing, and then finally he gets up to his shot, he's talking about bunker shot. And he ends up, what does he do? He holds it out for an eagle. Right. And I was so happy because that's all, they're, all they're going to do is remember that. And it's perfect. And they're all happy, and it was fantastic. And it was very, very exciting. And again, you can make anything you want, create a spectacle. Best thing you can do is create a spectacle. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect to set up on the range, I'm sure that created a lot of curiosity as mm -hmm. to what you were doing. So you know, as you can see, Lawrence, you know, like we talked about, he, he identified who his, who his students would be. He created the programs that they wanted. He marketed those programs. He executed those programs. And then what's next after that? And, and probably, I don't want to say most important, but certainly very, very important is, is to track what you've done. You know, and, and for Lawrence especially, that was important because of the new position at the club. You know, I'm sure there were some eyes on you as to, you know, is this going to work? Uh, what's the value to our membership? Uh, you know, is, it, is it a better value for Lawrence to be out there doing what he's doing or to be in the shop, you know, running your operation? So, there were probably a lot of a lot of eyes on this new position. So one of the things that we've created, and, and again, along with the Marketing Resource Center, I think this is a really very really beneficial tool for you. It's what we call the Revenue Scorecard. And it's basically an exercise, and Lawrence and I ran through this together, of 
really detailing your programs. <clears throat> you know, certainly at the end of the year, Lawrence, you know, you knew how much money you're putting in your pocket. We all know how much we're making, you know, in our salary, certainly, and then our, our lesson income. But do you really know the value that your programs and your instruction have to your facility? You know, and, and we found that most professionals didn't know that. So we created this tool to help you with that. And it's it's a tool designed not only to help you, you know, you don't need to share it with anybody, but it is designed to be excuse me, to be shared with your employer. You know, to really quantify what you're doing with your player development or instructional programs. And, and really show your employer the, the return on their investment in you. You know, now when we did this exercise with Lawrence, I mean we, we showed not only did he pay for himself, he paid for himself multiple, multiple times over. And some of the highlights that we found when, when doing this exercise with Lawrence, and you can see, I mean, over 2,000 more rounds just from his students. And, and most of his students were new beginners, yeah. uh, as, you, as you heard, or juniors. It's 2,000 more rounds. Opening up his Get Golf Ready to non-members. Two new members joined the club. And it's what, a $20,000 initiation fee? Yeah, something like that. So there's $40,000 because of his program. You know, and then of course you've got the monthly dues from those new members. There was a 35%, maybe a little bit more, increase in total lesson revenue. Because obviously you're not the only instructor in that program. You're leading most of the programs. But I think what we were doing was, was helping the other instructors in the club as well, clearly, um, you know, for that to increase over 35%. And uh, the, the bottom number, and I, we believe that this is a little conservative, mm -hmm. you know, um, because we were very conservative in, in doing this exercise, but over, over a quarter of a million dollars because of Lawrence's player development programs that he's just talked to you about. The junior programs, the Get Golf Readies, the Cigars and Coming Up, mm -hmm. all of these things, a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, you think, you think Lawrence is a value to his employer, or to that club, or to the management company? Huge value, huge value. It'd be crazy to, to let you go at this point. So he's really quantified his value. Number one, as a PJ professional, and number two, he's quantified these programs that he's created. And you know, maybe you could you could add some insight as to you know this exercise that we did in the school yeah. and how it helped you. Well, I think it's important to to quantify what I do, but I think the way I use it mostly is to see where I'm weak and where I'm strong. Um, if I'm weak somewhere, you know, I tend to just either let it go and not do it, or maybe ramp up and really aggressively do it. But mostly what I've done is just kind of focus on the things that I'm really, that I'm strong with. And, uh, and that's, that's partly why I like that. So it showed me what I was able to uh, be strong at and to really focus on that. And we're going to need to go through this again in the next couple. Yeah. The, end of the year and we can uh, do it again and, and compare what he's done in 14, uh, you know, in comparison to what he did in 13. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, well, I think also just being aware of like the different types of things that you can do. Like as an example, with my I do a Wednesday clinic that I have all ladies, and um, I noticed that since they've been doing this, I get like 10 or 12 ladies each week, and they started buying new clothes. They're going into our golf shop, they're buying things. I mean, you don't realize how much that adds up. Right. You know, each outfit, you know, and you don't really take it out. Right? So, uh, they're enjoying, the bottom line is they're enjoying their club. They're enjoying, yeah. Um, Part of it. Wasn't there a member that was contemplating leaving the club? Absolutely. She joined the program. And, and she ended up staying. She, she had a resignation letter in, and she actually, after, you know, the class, she liked it so much that she took the resignation. That's a success. That was awesome. That was very cool. Yeah. Staying a member for the yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she's enjoying the club and mm -hmm. really getting older. So that means not only taking lessons and playing, but cleaning, uh, buying merchandise, mm -hmm. buying equipment, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things are related. And this, this tool helps you kind of dive in and, and really figure out what the value is. Before we wrap up, I, I wanted you to know that on the back table where the water is, we have a couple things for you. Mentioned that brochure that Lawrence created. It's a great example of how to market yourself and market your programs. There's also a couple of handouts, uh, player development resources. 
it highlights you know, some, some national initiatives, national programs, tells you about the Marketing Resource Center and the Revenue Scorecard, has my contact information on it. Also, there's an outline of if you do choose to create a player development program, it kind of maps out a six month plan of what you should be doing. Because just like anything that you do in your operation, uh, you know, your, your member guests, let's take for example, that's a huge event. You know, it takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of marketing. You don't just say, hey, we're having a member guest this weekend, let's throw it together. It's the same thing with player development. You, know, you can't expect to just throw something together and have it be a success just like everything you do as your club. So th this is a great guide to kind of, not that you have to follow it step by step, but it kind of gives you a guide as to what you should be doing if you're going to be introduced programs in the summer. Okay, what should you be doing now to prepare for that? And it's double-sided, so it, it, you know, I know for our professionals here in the desert, obviously your, your season is a little bit different. Um, our coastal facilities, complete opposite. So there, there's two timelines on there. So we do have those resources in the back. We do have a few more minutes if anybody has any questions for me or for Lawrence, we'd we'll be happy to answer those. Julie? Lawrence, how many opportunities do you guys have at your club? I know that you said that you're not the only one, but do you, do you are, like, you know, using sub-learning or? Well, on these, yes. I would say that if you, I'd probably do about 60% of the lessons, 70%. I would say that I do. How many other instructors are there? Uh, there's Pat Burke. There's uh, three or four. Three, yeah, probably about three or four. Three or four. I'd say I do about sixty percent of the business. Of course, I, I know you're a humble man, and, and maybe feel uncomfortable me asking this, but you're not to fight numbers. But obviously, you know, when I said you created something from nothing. And not only the scope of the programs that you're running, but also for yourself from an income standpoint, you know, things improve dramatically. So maybe you could just touch on that a little bit. Well, before I did this, uh, I worked in the shop, so I had those shop hours, uh, and I always taught a lot. I was always, even as a full time employee, I still always did the most amount of lessons because that's what I love. I love being out there, I should say, but I clock out and then I go to the gym. They didn't watch you come in. Uh, it didn't matter to me. I just loved doing it and making it happen. Um, so yes, it's, it's definitely increased my income, but I don't have the shop, you know, hours in there, so that's not included at all. In it. So it's it's very good. It's a lot of fun. Love what you do. Would you do anything differently than what you've done? You've been in this position a couple of years now. Anything that you would do differently? Um, well, I think differently, yeah, it's a good question. I would say that I would probably include other instructors in my programs, get them more involved. I kind of, not kept it to myself, but no one was as passionate as I was, and I was still the new kid on the block at Proto. You never leave, you just kind of just are always there, and very little turnover, and I was the new guy for a long time. And I think that was the stumbling block for that. But I would have made an effort to really, really include more people, you know, instructors, you know, because then they'd help market it, they'd help do these things instead of being kind of on their own. Well, they've certainly proven that this model works and yeah. it's successful, so I'm sure you've mm. energized and inspired some pros, and I, I hope that you've energized and inspired some of the guests mm. uh, out here today. So I appreciate your time, Lawrence. Thanks for having you. And Thank you uh, for everything that you guys do on a daily basis to yeah. grow our game. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, my information is in the back there. Lawrence at Code Casa, so easy to get in touch with me. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. That was terrific. Really interesting to hear a success story from Laura Rome. And who knew that the real secret was champagne and cognac? <laughs> but as you can see, a lot of thought was put into what Lawrence created there, and very successful. And uh, if we didn't get some ideas out of that, then we weren't listening. Our next presenters, while they're getting mic'd up here. Yeah, she's good. She's good 
Yeah. Nikki and Lawrence went off with a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> no, Nikki, come back. Looks like everyone's trying to take a break. We have a break scheduled in an hour, so. <laughs> yes. Our next presenters are longtime PGA professionals here in the Southern California section. Uh, Ken Farrell, a lot of you know. Ken is the National PGA Employment Career Consultant for the Southern California and the Aloha sections. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Ken for a long time. His resume is really quite remarkable as far as what he has done in the golf business and certainly makes him very qualified to speak on our topic today, the business of teaching. He was the director of golf and director of career services for the Professional Golfers Career Academy, owner of Feral Golf Management, which acquired the lease of the Practice Golf Center in Menifee. He was a regional golf professional and a member of the National Merchandising Team for American Golf Corporation. He had management positions at Tuscan Ranch Golf Club and Dove Canyon Country Club. He was the founder and owner of Team Golf Corporation, which consulted to open and operated over 20 projects in the 1990s. And in 1995, he was developed player development programs and golf academies for the Arnold Palmer Golf and Nike Golf. So Ken has been there. He's been a successful instructor. He's been a successful owner operator of golf academies. He really, really knows not just you know the business of golf and, and helping you in your career, but he really knows what it is to be a successful instructor and, and run a business. Um, Jason Taylor is now the executive director of the Lorena Ochoa Foundation. He was the 2004, oops, excuse me, 2011, 2010-2011 um, Southern Cal PGA president. I've known Jason for a long time. We went on the section board together for a long time. Um, Jason is one of those guys that, that doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. Um, we sometimes disagree, and it gets kind of funny in, in, in the boardroom because we get going back and forth, but ultimately, um, we really respect each other and respect each other's opinions. Um, Jason now is in his role as, as, as the ED of the Lorena Golf or Lorena Choa Foundation as a number of instructors working for him. Um, he will, I think, have some interesting stories to tell you about what to do and what, what not to do as an instructor. Um, his background also as an owner operator here in Southern California, running golf courses. Um, he was the 2004 Southern California PGA Golf Professional of the Year. So, two accomplished guys, two guys that really, I think, can give you some insight into, again, the business of teaching golf. Because at some level, we are all business people. We all run our own business. 
We're either good at it or maybe not so good at it. We're doing it at different levels. Some of us are independent contractors, some of us are owner operators, some of us are employees. But irregardless of that, we are businessmen. We have a business of golf instruction. That's why we're here. We want to learn how to do things better. I think these two gentlemen will give us a unique perspective on that. So I give you Mr. Kenny Farrell and Mr. Jason Taylor. spent some time with this morning. This is uh, fun for me and uh, interesting for me too. I don't, I don't teach, uh, uh, but I have a, a, a long history with it and a lot of perspective on it. Uh, to give you a quick bit of some of that history, I worked at a family-owned golf course, Roof Hills in Riverside. Uh, real low cost daily fee, uh, 40 bucks on weekends and 25 on during weekdays back then. Uh, and uh, part, excuse me, part of the family that owned it which was great and kind of seemed like, you know, you're part of the kind of company you give you a whole bunch of money, you're part of the deal, but that, you know, we had to work from the ground up, washing dishes, cleaning range balls, working the counter, uh, and I did all that. Where I made some money early on was uh, teaching, and I figured out early, I was in my early 20s, and uh, you go work behind the counter for, I think it was $7 and a quarter an hour, and you put in your eight-hour shift, and it was fantastic, I thought, uh, until I went and taught, and made 25 bucks or something like that, and well, you said, well, 45 minutes to an hour and tripled my money. Really grew on that and uh, made that a focus of what I did. And uh, real time, I actually bought my first house when I was 24 years old based on uh, just teaching income alone. So when Bill said I kind of walked the walk, I, I dove right into it and figured out how to make a lot of money doing that uh, for a 24 year old. Uh, being involved with section board, I got to visit a lot of facilities uh, and you get to see what's working, you see what's not working. Uh, and since then, I also have uh, been a golf course consultant uh, in Asia, in Latin America, and in the USA. And again, you go into these facilities and you're seeing some people that are just fantastic at what they do. And you see some people that aren't fantastic. And you really, uh, it's just an exercise in best practices. Uh, the focus today is not necessarily on best practices, because one of the things that I see is the big separator between success and failure, or almost success, is just trying and perspective and realizing where you are. So. I'm going to jump right in with some numbers, and this, I've seen, I've talked to teachers all over the place, and it's amazing how many of them haven't done any numbers, they haven't started their year with what they want to do, and these are real powerful to me, I, I do these once or twice a year, and every time I do them, I go check my math, because I just can't believe how much money we made at some low cost. This is a $25, based on a $25 an hour golf lesson, this is what you do, working 24 hours a week, if you can give just six lessons a week, do maybe four series, excuse me, two, two series, uh, and do some clinics. Eight people, $10 a piece. You know, 24 hours, and that's including some time for setting up and tearing down. That's almost 30 grand a year. It's just a part-time job. That beats the tar out of working behind a counter. It's pretty, it's pretty impactful to me to see what can be done. If you go to $50 an hour, a lot of us can get $50 an hour in most any market. You're a $50,000 a year job. It's closer to 52000 than 51 with those same numbers. It's just 24 hours a week, and that does include time not teaching. That includes time setting up your range, breaking down your range, and some back of house work. Here's where the numbers really start to change. I call this a full-time job of 32 hours. $70,000 a year just at $50 an hour. And that's, that's a lot of money. It's certainly a lot more money than most head golf professionals are making in Southern California. What's the average golf income for a golf professional? Professional? Uh, about $62,000 overall. And how many are working less than 40 hours a week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that lucky person? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 time with it pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, so these, these are just impactful numbers to me. $75,000 part time, pushing $75,000. Then you get to the full time. And again, that's just 32 hours a week. And that includes some non teaching time. Let's get to seven parents' time. It's 100 grand, $100,000. And look at the number, that's 14 private lessons. That's not 14 individual customers. It's harder to come by 14 individual customers than it is to come by 14 activities. Someone's going to take two lessons a week, some, some kids maybe. Uh, the series, sell four of them. That's also continued our. Uh, uh, including the hours for keeping the series going. I realize when you sell a series, you have to do that more than one week. Uh, and the clinics. 
eight people, just $20. It's just $20. It's $100,000 a year. And I don't know of any job in the golf industry working in management on the other side or someone giving you 100 grand a year and you're working less than 40 a week. Now, I, I expect you, that's part of the, the deal, or part of my point is the perception, you're going to have to work more than 40 hours a week to do this. You're going to have to put in some time. We're going to come to that in a moment. Uh, the other thing I included in here, I highlighted in red, all of these are based on 46 weeks a year. There's more weeks than 46 in a year. So you got downtime, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you got downtime for uh, weather, you got downtime for courses renovating, uh, aerating, doing all their stuff. But even during that time, you can still make money in that time if you want to work. And that's a great time to do golf vacations, golf trips, outings. You keep expanding it, but it's also a great time to recharge. 46 weeks a year, $75 an hour base price, $100,000 a year. Here's where I see the difference here. And you got two people up here. You got one of my favorites, Perry Farrell, uh, who's a rock star. And then you got the businessman on the right. And I'm preaching to the choir in this group. Everybody got up Monday morning, drove out to the desert, stayed the night, maybe went home, came back Tuesday morning. This is the choir. Everybody is engaged in what they do. The rock star is the one I see failing. And I see a lot of these coaches out there. You know, it's time to do the clinic or the lesson. They cruise right out, right as the time to start. And it's 9 o'clock lesson, 8.55, maybe they're there, all's going well. 9.55, they're wrapping up saying thanks. And, nine, and, and one hour later, they're dropping the mic and walking off. And that's just not going to work. If you're not more invested than that, if you're not putting the time into that, if you're not doing the back of the house, if you don't realize your job isn't done, when that hour is up and you drop that mic and walk off, uh, you're probably going to struggle unless you just have the most wonderful situation in the world and you're at the most wonderful place in the world. There has to be more effort put in. You're really both. You need to be that rock star on one hand where you have a presence. When you walk out on that range, everybody knows that's the coach. You know, you're the golf coach. You're the person that can fix my slice. Uh, but you have to do that back of house. You have to work on those budgets. You have to measure. You have to plan. You have to do short-term plans. You have to do long-term plans. There's time away. If you do 40 hours of lessons a week, you're going to have to work another 10, 12, 15, maybe 20 hours to make sure you can do 40 hours of lessons the next week because they will go away. Here's, here's where it gets into it. I like to uh, uh, quote the venerable poet Ice Cube, uh, chickity check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> this is where it goes into being that rock star. There's so many of these failing coaches just see themselves as that rock star person. They, they got this big giant ego. You know, I'm not going to teach for less than $150 an hour. Oh, there's someone else in my range teaching for $40 an hour. They're ruining it. No one sees my genius. You know, take a look at yourself. Go look in the mirror. You're worth what you can get. It's all you're worth is what you can get. It's just like selling a home. You can try to, you can put on. Uh, what you think is going to be the value, but the value is really what someone's going to pay you. And don't be offended if that number is lower than you think. 25 bucks an hour beats the heck out of a counter, and you're making a whole lot more money. And then this, this has somewhat of a negative connotation. I like oh, that old MC Green himself, and there ain't no future in the front. He said, you know, you got to be really careful. Don't laugh. You got to be really careful when you take to that revenue scorecard. The revenue scorecard is fantastic. I love numbers. They tell a story, and I can't do any math, but I've, I've grown to love numbers since I've become self-employed, because they tell that story. But you got to be careful. You know, with that revenue scorecard, you walk in to your owner, and, and especially after the day when he just finished paying his estimated taxes or his, his water bill, and you go in and say, look what I did. You know, use the microphone here. Look what I did. I gave 40 golf lessons. I made all this money. There's a fine line there. You did some of that, you're responsible for some of that, but let's look at it from a purely business standpoint. If I want to rent a space in the local mall, <coughs> and I want to be right next to Nordstrom's, or I want to be right next to a food court, I'm going to pay more money to be next to one of those anchors mm -hmm. than if I go out in South 40, the entrance that no one goes into, and there's uh, three other closed down stores next to me. That owner may look at that and say, you know, that's great. I think it's fantastic. Look at all that revenue you did because people came to my golf course. You got the lesson because you were at my golf course. But you got to take all that into, into, into consideration when you're looking in the mirror, when you're looking at who you're going to present to. Keep it in perspective and present it in a very appealing, appealing way, so you're not you're not offending anybody. It, you know, on one side, it's a lot easier for an owner to find someone who can fix a slice than for us to find another golf course to go work at. So 
but you're in a good place, you, you protect that. There's a lot of us that can pick slices. There's not as many golf courses, and there's less golf courses this year than there was last year. And there's probably going to be less in 2016 than there was in 2015. So we're shrinking a little bit. Here's the other one I see. Going back to that don't pout, don't pout in there. Uh, I see all these failing coaches. You just pouted, I'm worth $100 an hour. I'm so smart. I read all the magazines. I, I, I got all, on all the blogs that tell me what the tour players are doing behind the scenes. So when all the, the students come to the range, I can tell them what Mickelson said or Tiger said. Uh, it's only you're only worth what you're going to get. And don't be afraid if that number's lower. If you if you're only if you can only charge fifty dollars an hour, you can still be successful. You saw the numbers there. And you need to look at the fact that if you're only charging fifty, you're not successful. The fact it's not because people aren't recognizing your genius. Because enough people aren't taking lessons at fifty dollars an hour. You're not selling. And the other thing I hear is that starving artists are the same thing as genius. At the end of the day, you walk off, no one took a lesson from you. Wham, wham, wham. I'm so smart. I, I should be paid $175 an hour, but I can only get $75. You know, at the end of the day, who's the starving artist? It is the coach. It's the coach. You're the one that didn't get paid. So you want to take that turn into a positive. Analyze those things. It's hard to look at the results, hard to look at the results, hard to look at the numbers. I love what Lauren said. He, he looks at his revenue scorecard and finds out where he's weak and where he's strong. A lot of people don't want to measure just because you can see failure. As soon as you start measuring, you can fail. Uh, the reason I didn't jump on a steel this morning before I got here wasn't going to be cool. My wife was there <laughs> up early. Kids are there. Everybody's going to make fun of me. It was a lot easier for me to just throw on a shirt and run to my car and get out of there. <laughs> but the truth is, if I'd measured, maybe I'd be so happy that I'd have something to, to base it on and go forward. Uh, so here's another uh, for, almost forgot to talk about this. Here's one thing I'm talking about perspective that I really get a kick out of in the golf business. If I went in, I'm the manager, and I went in, and you're the $10 or $12 an hour shop attendant, assistant golf pro, and I said, promotion time. From now on, you never have to work the guy. Not ever going to touch that register again, and I'm going to pay you $23 an hour. You're going to high five me. You're going to go home. You're going to call your family. You're going to call your friends. You're going to celebrate. You're going to go meet Larry and have a herbacier or cognac at the end of the night. Uh, until I tell you, oh, no, no, when you come back next day, well, your job is I'm going to, you're going to work eight hours a day teaching at 20 or $23 an hour. Then you go right back. And there's so many pros go right back into that mode. Well, I'm not going to teach for $20 an hour. You work a counter 40 hours a week for 10 Go out there and work that, work that uh, range for $20 or $25 an hour. Before long, you're going to be up to 40 50 60 70 100 whatever you can command. And it really truly is what you can command. Uh, the other things I hear, and this is all the negative stuff. We'll get to positive in a minute. Again, I know it's not appropriate for this crowd, but you came here. I wish everybody who is at home complaining about how they're not making a living teaching was hearing this. Uh, you know, it goes back to that. It's one of those uh, comments that came into popularity back when I was a manager at Hill Golf Course. Some kid had come in and maybe dressed wrong or maybe he wants to be a golfer, but he has a beard, unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> they would come in and say, uh, you know, if you don't like the way I'm dressed, you don't like the way I talk, it's on you. I hated that statement. It's been around for what, 10, 12, 15 years. It's on me. Fine. Okay, next. Move on. <laughs> You're the one that loses. It's on you or it's on me, whoever it's on. I'm still going to hire somebody. I'm still going to give somebody money. I'm still going to talk, take a golf lesson. I'm still going to give somebody money. I'm just not going to give it to you. So who's it really on? I, I don't, can't even put the, the grammatics of that together. And then I, I like, I really love teaching. It really is the purest form of being a golf professional. It really fantastically is. It's true capitalism. You can get whatever you're worth. If you're worth a million bucks an hour, a million bucks a day, Find that one or two or 20 people to pay you that for a year, you're going to work one, two, or 20 days a year. If your product is worth 50 an hour, it's going to shake itself out. So you're going to get what you're worth. So if you want to be worth more, then take a look in the mirror. Figure out, okay, what can I do to make my product that much more valuable that I could charge double what I'm charging now in one year? And this is an interesting, interesting industry. In the last few years, I've worked somewhat out of the golf industry too. And no one shares anything. It's 
hard to get information. It's so hard to get information. But in the golf industry, uh, Billy McKinney here started a, a blog on Facebook, or a Facebook page. And we've met each other a couple times, we don't know each other, we've never hung out and had a drink or watched a game or anything. But this is interesting, just through the fact that we're PGA members in Southern California, if I want to know something about teaching, odds are I could probably call him. He'd probably say, come on down, spend the day, I'll show you how to do this. He'd probably buy me lunch for coming down at the end of the day, and then I'd go home with a wealth of information and a free meal. It's a fantastic, fantastic industry. I know I've done it on the management side. Don't know how to do something? Make a few phone calls, someone will tell me. You know, I'm trying to work in a little uh, food service industry right now. The hardest thing, I can't find a recipe for something. No one will tell me. You've got to go earn it. This is a fantastic, fantastic industry. So we've got to take advantage of those things. You know, and here we're kind of assuming with the, with the, uh, the target of this presentation is everybody can use this light. Your product is good. Your product is good. After your product is good, What's next? Well, the only other thing is your business plan and marketing, if you have a good product. You have so, so many, so many resources to have a good product. Uh, and then when you're looking at that pricing, you know, think about it. What's so degrading to charge $25 an hour? I'm not saying go there, you're already there. But if you're starting out and want to build your business, and you figure out where your market is, maybe it's in Beaumont, maybe it's in Pacific Palisades, you know, cheap is cheap is a moving number. Uh, there's nothing degrading about that lower number. You know, that's where you're going to grow from. And think about it too. We're, we're just fixing slices. You know, we're not saving people. There's no one on their deathbed, and we're pulling them up, and that's nothing they owe you for the rest of their life. You fix the slice, and they're probably going to slice again and have to come back to you in another month or two. So keep it in, keep it in mind. Uh, I've talked to some pros. This this cracks me up. Staying on perspective here. With clinics, go to a twenty-five dollar clinic, twenty-five dollar an hour clinic. Teaching at twenty-five dollars an hour, no more than that. You know how much I know? I went to Chapter Four while in nineteen ninety-eight, teaching at twenty-five dollars an hour. Uh, I, I can't believe they don't do the math. And you'll teach for fifty or seventy-five or hundred an hour for one person, because there's a little bit of luster and a little bit of prestige, and maybe teaching that that person that's uh, maybe a little good player. And you're out there one on one and you see your staff back. So $25 an hour, get four people, get eight people, okay, 12 people, you triple your rate. I used to do a lot of clinics and I figured out early on, I used to do it, I remember doing a bunker clinic once, uh, and I could fit like one and a half people in our bunker. So that was neat. And I figured out, wow, if I can do these clinics differently, do them exhibition style, talk about a method or how I feel, how I feel I should, he should hit a wedge or he should hit a chip shot. I can put 12 people out there on the side of the cutting green, I'm not spending time one on one. I'm out in front of them, I'm showing them a method. I can go down the line and give them each a minute one on one, and I can sell some uh, private lessons and group lessons out of that. But at 25, it's 12. I'm a 24 year old kid making 300 bucks an hour. I figured out how to do that a few times a week. It was pretty dang cool. And I, but I see coaches now still. I did, I did some clinics a year or so ago just to uh, go out and have some fun at the Lorraine Shore Golf Academy. Uh, and you know, I'd have the comment, that's a lot of people, 12 people. That's 300 bucks. Spent 15 minutes setting up. Spent another 15 minutes putting together an email and blasting it out to my database. And I spent a few minutes afterwards. I wasn't trying to get any lessons afterwards. I didn't even really have to spend a lot of time. I just introduced them to my other coaches after it was over. So for that time, I made 300 bucks. So when you're Planning these things, look at that plan. What can you do to maximize? What can you do to maximize? Then here's where we're at. This is the difference. Maybe this doesn't apply to someone who's working uh, as an assistant golf professional and wants to give four or five golf lessons a week. This maybe doesn't apply to you. This is more targeted to someone who wants to teach for a living or have it as their, their primary source of income or their own business. And I look at it. It is your own business, and here's where, again, I see some of the failing, struggling coaches uh, uh, drop the ball right here. They don't realize it's their own business. They kind of walk in, they have that employee mentality, it's like they own a business, and you can't have an employee mentality in your own business. You have to realize there's back of house to be done. You have to take care of accounting. You gotta pay rent. You know, rent's kind of a, a scary word uh, in the golf teaching business. Uh, that's just the way it goes in many places, and I, happen to think it's, it's kind of right. Uh, you have to do marketing. 
You have to build, you have to build, you have to plan, and that all takes time. So it's really, really important that you, you really look at yourself as a true business owner. Don't be just that singular standalone rock star that walks out on the range, gives a lesson, drops the mics, and walks off and maybe regales some people with the, the 1998 four ball story or how you almost made the tour. Uh, how? Start from the very beginning. Write down a number. What do you want to make? What do you need to make? What do you need to make? I need to make 100 grand a year. I need to make 30 grand a year. And then put a plan together. You can't just, you know, you can't just roll the balls out and get your number. You got to have a plan. It's going to take me six private lessons a week at $75 an hour. I've got to sell one clinic with 10 people for $25 an hour, and I should sell one group lesson uh, based on maybe $25 an hour each. And four golf lessons and discount that 15% and sell that to carry that on, I can get to $47,000 a year. And I could do that over, over 43 weeks. So you gotta start with that plan. And then write it down. Write it down. It sounds silly, does that mean? No, it's not big. It might be your lanyard. Oh, I didn't want to wear that. Very <laughs> Write it down. You always hear that if you want something to happen, write it. If you want something to happen, write it. You know, when I worked at this family-owned business and had a great teaching income and then worked myself to being a general manager and had a nice salary on top of it, I never had a budget. I never wrote anything down. I became self-employed. Wow. I didn't have, you know, two weeks came by, there was no check waiting for me. Two more weeks came by, there's no more check waiting for me. There's no insurance. What happened here? became a little different reality. And I, boy, I got the pen and paper out. Started writing it down. And it's amazing, when you write those things down, and you track it, you tend to get there a lot more quickly uh, and a lot more often than when you don't. You just kind of wake up in the morning and, and move on to do, doing your thing for the day. You gotta have a plan. And the measuring is difficult. I mean, a lot of people don't measure because they don't, they don't want to fail. And that's just the truth of it. You gotta measure, don't look at it as failure, look at it as Extremely, extremely valuable information. Uh, one of the things I look at in uh, too is who your customer is. I see this quite a bit. I talk to so many coaches. You know, their their goal is to be on the range at Augusta one day. Goal is to be on the range. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be famous. I worked in China, and that was how they always used to want to pay you. Uh, I'm going to make you famous. We pay you a little bit, but make you famous. Well, if you're famous, you're going to pay me more than we originally talked about. Famous is a lot of work, I think. I don't know, I've never been famous, but I assume it would be. Uh, you know, I look at those good good players, and if I had to do it again, and I was real fortunate where I was at before a group uh, where I had a good combination of people, but I ended up teaching some really good players, and it was fun. I worked with a couple of LPGA Tour players, and the truth is, they actually cost me money in hindsight. And I'm working with that great player. Uh, you tend to become friends. Uh, you end up not charging as much or charging for everything. And you, you spend an inordinate amount of time with that person. You know, my, my superstar A player is coming out today. Uh, I've got to keep my lesson, my lesson book open. I can't teach Saturday morning, but coming out, we're going to spend three or four hours and have breakfast together. You know, it's a lot more profitable to have someone shooting 90 and rolling them on. Turn over, turn over, turn over, turn over. Their money, dollar for dollar, was the same. One dollar from the good player is the same as one dollar from the person who wants to break 100. But I can get more people who want to break 100. I'm not saying that's the way it would go, but if I went back to teaching, I would go right that route. I would try to find people who want to break 100, 90, 80, and I would steer clear of the people that are trying to uh, go make the tour. I don't think I would go that go that way again. You know that? Do you want to be famous? Does anyone really know? I would see that a lot too. Uh, you got a, you got a great player, and they won the the Greater Banning Junior Open 11 to 12 division. Your student doesn't really, the other students don't really know. I know it's fun, and I know you want to promote that a little bit, but your best customers, your best commercials are going to be just golfers. People, the more golfers you have to come out and play golf, go out, have fun, play better, and they're going to tell their friends. I heard, uh, uh, you know, the first time, their first hour, they're talking about referrals. That is the 
absolute golden ticket in golf course golf, or golf instruction. If you're not getting referrals, you need to go to more of these seminars and go listen to uh, the great teachers because they'll teach you how. And uh, happy customers are the absolute best. How do you measure that? How do you measure success? There was a great string really on your uh, Facebook page. You know what's great? How do you measure it? You know, in my opinion, it's just happy customers who play better. I call them customers, not necessarily students, because I'm always trying to ingrain the coaches that I work in. They are your customer. You don't own them. They can leave. They can go to a coach right next door, right across the street. They can decide to not play golf anymore. So I like to think of them that way, just to keep it in perspective. Uh, some ideas for this. I'm going to go with better to have a lot more options. Here, here's one thing that's kind of crazy, too, just perspective-wise. If I were a full-time coach, this is just the opposite of maybe someone working in working counter and giving a few lessons. If I were a full-time coach, I would rather have 10 students paying me $50 an hour than five students paying me 100. Now that sounds totally backwards. All the other, you're gonna, I've been to all these marketing things that come in, so you've got to raise your rates, you've got to have more, and that can, there's, a, there's a, another truth to that. But if I'm a full-time golf coach, I don't want those fluctuations in my income. If I'm totally dependent, on one husband and wife that pays me $100 each an hour, twice a week, and they decide to go on a four-week vacation, or they decide they want to ride motorcycles instead, uh, you're out of business, just like that. And I can, if I can get those 10 paying me 50, and I'm doing a good job, it won't take me more than a year or two to get my average up to 75, and then 80, and 85, and 90. It's really easy to go up, very easy to go up. It's hard, hard and embarrassing to go down. We've all seen coaches come out and, Say, I'm going to charge this, and no one shows. It's, it's hard. And what do you do when you do have a, a little bit of success at that, say, $150 an hour, but your real rate should have been 100 so How do you take all those students who are paying 150 and get that, get down to that, that proper rate? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I've seen it, and I, I haven't figured out a solution, other than try to mask it through group events. Work through group events, focus on that, and try to move on. But to actually change that rate, uh, and it goes back to the beginning, how set the right price. You gotta have no ego in this. You gotta wipe the ego off. You gotta go get in front of that mirror and get in front of the computer too and say, what can I sell my product for? The product could be a frisbee, in this case it's a golf lesson. You know, what can I sell my product for? What's someone gonna buy it for? It's easier to draw. Uh, here's here's one too, kind of a side note, junior rates. And here's that perspective of looking at the business. I've talked to some coaches, do you have a junior rate? Well, no, uh, my regular rate's 100, my junior rate's 50. If I put a junior rate out, I'm going to have just a bunch of kids taking $50 golf lessons. I would use this as a marketing tool, even if I didn't like kids. <laughs> I, would put out, I would put out a lower junior rate. Because I control my schedule. I'm going to do two of these a week. At least it makes me look good. It gives me the perception of I love kids, I'm part of the PGA, I'm part of the community. Uh, it, it sounds funny, but you've got to have it. You're marketing a brand. You're marketing a brand. And don't worry, you're not going to have 100 kids sign up for it because you control your schedule. And the nice thing is that maybe you're not full. Maybe you can start filling in from there. And then you can wean them off the other side. And as you grow and do better, you'll be able to uh, increase that rate. And, and I went out, oh, I went out over here. It's 10 for 50. Uh, the bottom happy customer. They're, they're the best commercials. You can do all the marketing and advertising you want, but the best thing you're going to do is have happy customers. They're going to tell, they're going to tell people, and they're, their friends are going to see them play better golf, and they're going to have more fun. This marketing, this is, an, this is another one I see quite a bit from the, the, the strugglers. You know, you got these logos that are giant, NBA, Target, McDonald's. Uh, they're constantly spending billions of dollars every year making sure their logo stays in front of you. So it's really like a rowboat with a hole in it. It'll float, and you keep bailing. You, as soon as you take a break from your marketing, you are going to go like this. You're going to go like that. So you can't take a break. And but that's how business is. If you own a business, if you own the hot dog stand on the corner, you've got to continually work it, continually put effort into it, and make sure people come to your hot dog stand instead of the one two blocks over. Core to doing that, in my experience, is database. Database, database. This is just a numbers game. If I want to do a golf clinic, I need 10 people to sign up. I personally have close to 10,000 valid email addresses in my database. I gather them vigorously. You know, it's almost like saying, hello, hi, I'm Jason, what's your email address? And I'm just that aggressive about it. Because when we do a golf clinic, if I do a golf clinic, 
I need this tiny, tiny percentage to say, that sounds like Bob walked the golf course Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock and paid $25. I need just a few people to say yes. If I get to 10,000, it's a tiny number. If my, if my database is 100, I need 10% of them to do it. I'd rather have 1%, uh, rely on that 1%. Uh, so be aggressive. They're, they're so valuable. You know, they, make sure I don't cut too far into Ken's time here. Uh, businesses give you free stuff for giving, for giving them a fake email address. You go into Applebee's, you give a fake email address, you get an appetizer, you get something. But they're that valuable. These smart companies with billions of dollars have figured out how to make more money, and if that's how valuable they, they got a number to it. Each email address is worth $1.75. Or each email address is worth $2.25. Uh, you know, I'm losing the stat on what that was. I had a friend who was in that business, and he had it figured out where it cost him. You know, two dollars and eighty cents to get each email address, and the each email address he got was valid was four dollars and fifty cents. Real smart guy, real successful, uh, fairly well retired in his early forties, and I'm forty-five, and I don't know when that retirement is coming. You know, wish I'd started these things years and years earlier. Uh, the touches, again, it's a constantly bailing, bailing water, bailing water. You need to be engaged. You need to be engaged, and it takes work, and that's why. I showed just 32 or 24 hours a week. I never even showed a 40 hour week. But the truth of it is, if you actually own a business or you're a GM or head coach of a golf course, 40 hours a week half is almost part time. So you work more than 40 hours a week. That'd be nice if you did. Uh, but when people start giving you 100 grand, they expect more than 40 hours a week. If you want to start getting towards those big numbers, you're probably going to have to work more than 40 hours a week. Uh, and be, be genuine, care. See, when I do the, the golf course consulting and I'm, we're charging a lot of money and building these 100 page books on how to make your golf course move real successful or more successful, that's what I say, what's the secret? There is no secret. Every golf course is different. Like every one of your facilities is probably different. Uh, but the real secret is the, the successful operators care and they try. They care and try. They show up, they care and they try. And people can smell the fake. If you're asking how so and so's kid's graduation party was and you're half listening to something else, they can tell, but if you really care, you can write it down, you know, put it on a calendar, oh, his birthday's coming up, his anniversary's coming up, I haven't seen you in two months, we'll just call and check on you. Your customers can tell that you're sincere and care, and they're gonna appreciate that, they will be loyal. Back to that uh, grab data you know, ideas again. I see a lot of golf coaches be real protective of what they do. I'm gonna give you a free tip. I earned 20 years of hard labor figuring out how to fix that slice. I'm not going to just give you a tip. Give it. It doesn't cost you anything, really. Give that five minute look. And when you do it, grab data. Everybody's got the video now. Hey, you want to see your swing? Let me give you, I'll, I'll send you a little recap of what we talked about this five minutes. I'll email it to you. You got that data. Now it's yours. It's worth it. And they're going to see you're a nice person. And if they have some success, they're going to come back out. Uh, other ideas, I had an assistant golf professional years ago that was just great. He killed it. Just started teaching and killed it. Uh, he would, his plan, he came up on his own. He'd just go play golf with different people. One hole, two holes, three holes. They didn't know him. They were all impressed. He hit the ball pretty hard. He would chip really well. He always made some putts. He had a real good chip for gap. Uh, and he picked up, he built a lesson business, teaching business in no time at all. Just from grabbing his clubs, taking 20 minutes, and going to play the 10th hole at Rupa Hill. He'd go hit an iron out there off the tee further than they hit a driver. Or he'd say, I'm just working on this little thing, this theory I'm working on. Next thing you know, they'll see him teach them after the round the next day. Uh, or I see what a lot of us do is we get in our comfort zone. We end up being a little mini celebrity sometimes in the golf world. You play with the same people all the time. You just kind of never get outside of your box. If you need new customers, you need to grab data, get outside of your box. And that was the best thing I ever saw him just going playing two or three or one holes. Uh, that data is valuable again. Offer a free clinic to groups or events. Uh, it doesn't have to be an hour. There may be a, a golf uh, tournament at your, your course coming in. Just talk to the management. They're going to love it if you're doing this for them. Hey, can I give a free 15 minute golf clinic for all the, play, all the, uh, the golfers coming out that day for the tournament? Uh, one, people are going to see you. Didn't cost you anything out of your pocket except a little bit of time. You didn't have to pay for the marketing opportunity to be in front of these people. Uh, they're going to get to know you. And often, Here's where that dollar for your facility is so valuable. Often transactions are a result of convenience. You know, I just buy what's in front of me. I'm not going to search real hard for something. I need to go on. I just get it back. Are you the golf pro? Okay, great. 
I'm going to take a lesson from you. Have your card. I'm going to play golf today. I'll, I'll, I'll see you on Saturday. It's it's a result of convenience. So get get in front of those people and find ways to grab data every time. In your database maybe it's 30 people right now. Really, if you get aggressive with it, it won't take long to make it 200, and it'll grow there. Uh, other things I saw guarantees. I like to guarantee, especially in a group format. I guarantee you, you know, if you do these things, you're going to reach your goals. I'm not giving a money back guarantee. I'm just give, I'll give you a spot in my next group lesson next time. And we're going to work together. And that customer is going to be really happy too. They're going to be really committed to me. They're not just taking the money and running. They actually care about my success. Uh, and that's, I thought that was another uh, great thing I've seen coaches do. Uh, Nikki talked about the marketing. Here, this is so simple. The clinics when I started doing it, Lorena and Soto Golf Academy, our most successful ones said chipping clinic, putting clinic. Had to hit a farther clinic. It wasn't lost in a story with a bunch of cool graphics. Now we made them look nice and sent them out, but it was just right in front of you. Chipping clinic, 9 a.m. Thursday morning, $25, one hour. Sign up here, click, sign up, pay the credit card, transactions done, clinics are filled in 30 minutes. Be real, real uh, clear and learn. There's so many resources out there to learn. Get on YouTube and start looking at marketing, personal marketing. Uh, go through those things. And if you're not getting it uh, or need help, hire a professional. It's a one-time cost. And I don't know, again, I've talked to a lot of teachers. Oh, I don't want to hire. You're, it's your business. You're investing in your business. How can you not invest in your business? If you believe in your product, and really the product should be one of the easier things to come by. You have so many resources. If you believe in the product, spend the buck. Help get someone to help with some marketing for you. Groups. I, I just love that. That's that's where the money is, in my in my opinion. You get more people. Teaching's easier. You're not going to be stuck if someone can't get anything. Uh, you move through, and you can get them for private lessons. More commercials. I'd rather give one one group of about eight, ten, twelve people than one golf lesson. But then when I have eight to ten, twelve people go out and say, "Oh, Wednesday afternoon to the clinic. It was so much fun." You got to do it next time. Again, they're easier to teach. And your landlord paying that rent. Uh, your landlord's going to love groups. He's going to love seeing like, oh, this, this coach is really is a value to my facility. We've got activity bringing people in. Uh, and then you offer more products and groups for that service, or more products and services for that group. These are people you've already vetted. You can feel it out in the middle, middle of the group. Oh, you want to go this way and offer them this next product. I can sell this next product to them. You've already spent an hour with these people. Uh, and social media, here's one that we hear a lot in some of the surveys I've done. Uh, you don't, don't brag. That's why I was making the jokes about the greater banning old and 11 to 12 year old division. <laughs> the student, you know, it's okay. They're curious. Did you play the tour? It's not going to be the question. We've all had the, the humbling answer of, well, no, I had my hamstring. Otherwise, I was there. <laughs> but, uh, they know. They know. Uh, social media, too. Uh, videos get more hits. You know, if I post something on our stuff, on uh, maybe the Loreno Show site or Academy site, and it's just a photo, I'll get half as many hits as if I put a video, half as many views, people like videos, and show the fun, and then people love to see themselves. Quit, don't focus on yourself, and focus on the student. Look, <coughs> you you want, definitely want to feature that you're in there as a coach, and they're, you're the one selling a product, your golf knowledge, but show the people, hey, you're gonna, I'm gonna put, you see I tagged you on that Facebook post, you see I put you on the Twitter, you see I put you on the Instagram, people love that. Their friends see it, it just spreads like wildfire. Everybody loves to see themselves. I'm a little disappointed I haven't seen Tom. No one taking my picture. This is great stuff. <laughs> uh, give me my phone. Uh, to summarize it, uh, you got to start with the goal. You got to figure out metrics. For me, it's measuring with money. Uh, Billy, that that's uh, stream you had about how to measure success or the future is great. Sorry, I didn't take my Sorry, <laughs> I already got I already got you on our <laughs> Facebook. So. All right, great, thanks. Uh, I, I, I beat this up round and round. How am I going to measure success at the Lorraine Ochoa Golf Academy? You know, the, the top end, that's easy. Are we profitable or not? Each month, we look at it. This month, I'm getting $40. The next month, I better make 80 and try to grow. And I really did start that low. Uh, but we stayed in the black. And part of it was I measured and worked and worked and put effort into it. And now for the coaches, how do you measure? All I came up with was money. If I'm making money, if I have more customers coming to me, I'm probably successful. It's hard to measure even strokes on a golf course. You know, if someone has a really great short game and they shoot 
40 for nine holes, but they get up and down a whole bunch. Uh, and you work with them a lot, and they keep shooting 40 for nine holes, but now they hit you know, six greens instead of one. Their score didn't really change, but they're having a lot less stress-free round and having a lot more fun. So it's hard to measure on just score alone. And then people want different things. They want fun. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, I come back to money. And then the plan, uh, product quality, can you teach? You gotta assume at the beginning of this, you can all teach. Everybody can fix a slice and make people happier. And then after that, you gotta market it. You gotta market it. And then the measure, measure it. It's, it's tough to see if you're failing. It's tough to have those bad months. But go back and those numbers tell a story. It could be the product, it could be the time of day, it could be your location. You need to find a different location. You need to move your business to a new location. Uh, and review it, and then you grow. Where do you want to be? You need those annual and long range plans. Take the time, write down a one year annual business plan. It doesn't have to be elaborate, you're not necessarily showing it to anybody, so you don't have to put all the fancy graphics on it, but go home and write it down. In 2015, I want to do this. Here's how I'm going to get there. And then write the five year plan, too. Five years, if your goal is to be on the range at Augusta, figure out what it's going to take to be there. If your goal is to make 100 grand a year teaching and work 46 weeks a year, write that down there. And, you know, I never, again, I never bought into these writing down things. I had a really kind of blessed youth where everything was just so easy. Uh, and it's harder work now. There's kids, and I don't have to feed myself. And there's now I got kids and a wife and car payments and mortgages and no, no regular income. Uh, I, I write stuff down. It's really important to put these goals together and put a plan together how we get there. I can't just wake up in the morning and wonder what's going to happen. So I really appreciate the time uh, today. This is neat, kind of intimidating for me to be in front of so many great teachers, especially a person who doesn't teach. Uh, but I really enjoy the opportunity. If anybody ever wants to talk about anything, uh, there's information there. Please give me a call. It's always on our uh, TJ website, too. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I watched my uh, mother-in-law give a seminar to the Southern California Edison. The first thing she started off was she said, I want everybody to stand up and then sit back down. So let's go ahead and start that. Stand up and sit back down. There you go. Yeah. Okay, everybody go ahead and sit down. <laughs> Now the next thing she asked everybody to do, we're going to skip this part, but she asked everybody to stand up and then give everybody else a hug in the room. Oh. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and skip that part, but I want to start out by uh, uh, making a couple of acknowledgments. The first one is to Bill and his team for putting on uh, uh, these teaching summits, because I really think that, and I told Bill this earlier, I think that's the best part of what we're doing in education. The, the turnout is always incredible, the education is great, the speakers are are amazing, and uh, so Bill, thank you for including Jason and I. Uh, the next would be uh, Andy Tooney, past president of the section, Andy Tooney, and Tom Addison in the back. You know, nobody accomplishes anything, I think, in this industry without mentoring. And when I start, uh, first started in the industry, Andy was the section president, Tom was on the board, uh, and then and then soon to be the uh, national president. And I looked at those guys and I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be like. And so I, I followed those guys and watched those guys and they've mentored me. And Jason said something uh, in the golf business, you know, you don't have to earn the help that you get. And I really learned this uh, from Tom. He came up and said he would help me and actually create bylaws for the Apprentice Association. I thought, well, I haven't proved anything yet. And Tom said, no, one day you're going to be up speaking in front of people, and we want to make sure that you're armed, that you have the tools and that you have the resources uh, to speak in front of people because you're going to influence people just like they were influencing people. So always keep that in mind. I, uh, I'm appreciative of Lawrence Gilbert uh, coming up here and sharing his story. And the reason is because that benefits us. And all of you have a story just like Lawrence's to share, and let's share those stories. There's a benefit in that. Uh, I want to acknowledge Jane Rosenberg and uh, Alan Ochi. Uh, my first and professional and then general manager uh, position is opening up a golf course. And 
somehow I got blessed with Jane and, and Alan. And Alan probably walked into the trailer when we were opening up, we had a box of shirts, and probably said, hey, I'd like a job. And we said, get a shirt. And he goes, when do we start? And we said, you started an hour, hour ago. And that's about how fast we were hiring people. But, but in my career, I've had great people around me as well, which, is, which has really helped me in anything that I can have succeeded. And then I spent, uh, as Bill said, I spent nine years as director of golf at the Professional Golfers Career College. You know what's so cool is that when I get an opportunity to get in front of people and, and speak, or I go to seminars, presentations, different chapter and section events, uh, I see a lot of you that um, I got to spend time with as you were starting your career. It's really neat for me to see what you have gone on and uh, uh, been able to accomplish while you uh, have been in the golf industry. So, so there are some acknowledgments. I always think that's important. I'll be honest with you, this job has given me a platform to say thank you to a lot of people that really helped me in my career. So, so I think that's uh, really important. My career has been very interesting. Uh, in the employment arena, we always talk about career planning. And I thought, career planning? I said, I'm an employment consultant. I never, ever thought of being an employment consultant. How would I plan for that? I never thought that I might be a director of golf at a, at a college for golf. For nine years, I would have, I have prepared for that. Um, I was a general manager. Never thought about being a general manager. The opportunity presented itself to me, and I took that opportunity uh, to be a business owner. That is something that I didn't want to do. The reason is I grew up at Mission Bay Golf Course, hitting golf balls. Uh, we used to steal as many as we could before high school matches, put them in our bag, go to Torrey Pines, practice that way to save $3. I probably owe somebody a lot of money as well as my, uh, my schoolmates, but, but I thought to myself at Mission Bay Driving Range, and I went, I want this. This is what I want. So I set out to be a player, and after five years, I found out, you know, I can't, I can't do that. In fact, Andy, before I had anything on my resume, Andy knew that I knew me as uh, a guy that used to hook the ball three fairways over, and, and I got lucky to break 75 once in a while. But after I got smart and said I can't make a living playing golf, now what am I going to do? I went to work uh, for Tom Sargent in Golf Club for uh, five years, and then later got to uh, manage golf courses, which was a great privilege. We opened a golf course. Um, the golf course was sold, and boy, I worked my way right out of the golf job. Because that golf course was sold for two and a half times what we built it. I worked my way right, right out of the golf and I thought, wow, what am I going to do? And I kind of went back to what I really love. You know, we all love playing and teaching. That's probably what got us into the industry. Uh, but the other thing that I loved really was business itself, and being around people. And so I started a company called Team Golf, and my uh, partner was a senior vice president of American Golf. So he was the manager side and the administrative side, and I was really the golf professional. Uh, the operator, the PGA professional side. And so I started building golf practice centers. Remember they used to be driving ranges in the early 90s? They changed over to golf learning centers. You know, if you look at the big centers like Stadium Golf now, uh, as a good example, they have batting cages, they have uh, uh, different amenities as well. Those are big learning centers. And geez, we should all strive to build stadium golf because we all would be employed. I mean, they employed 15 PGA professionals or something like that. I love when I sit in a room and listen, we go around and everybody tells where they're at and two tables say, yeah, I'm a golf instructor at Stadium Golf Center. So I got an opportunity to open up these golf learning centers. And my first one was uh, the Islands Golf Center, which was a floating 15-acre retention basin. We built the, the drains and we put seven trailers together and built a clubhouse. Uh, we hired instructors. Uh, it was the funnest thing in the world. And the uh, developer had a heart attack about a month before we opened the place, so I had to finish construction. I didn't know anything about construction. Just a, the, the, the situation that occurred to me. So we did that one. Uh, we did Iowa Park Golf Center. I said, Rick Hunter here, Rick was uh, at Iowa Park Golf Center. I took over one in Fremont Park Golf Center. 
in the north. Uh, actually did some consulting for Stadium Golf Center before ever before they ever turned any dirt. Uh, did a little consulting on Harborside, one in Las Vegas. That to me was a blast. My job was to drive up and down the freeways and look for places to build driving ranches. With that, I can tell you a thousand reasons why they failed. And most of them are gone. I can tell you about five good reasons why they succeed. And if you ever want to see one that is really done the right way, with all the financials in place, go down to the Marietta Golf Center, down in Marietta, California, where I, where I live, and go look at how Bill built that one and uh, the cost that he built it for and what they do down there. Of course, uh, you know, Ricky Fowler, that a million and a half golf balls down there, it's just a great little facility. What that did for me is give me the hope one day that I may be able to own my own golf center, which I was fortunate to do. I consulted to another one in Benefee. The owner sold it to a developer. The developer came back to me and asked me, hey, would you like to lease the facility? It was standing, it was in business, and everything was there. And uh, he said, you can only have it for 14 months because I'm going to build houses on it. But I knew that it was going to cost him $10,000 a month put security on the property. And so when we came together to negotiate our lease, I wrote him a check for $14, dollars a month. And I handed it to him, and I kind of laughed. I said, I don't expect to see you for 14 months. And he looked at me, and he goes, I knew that was coming. <laughs> but I knew I was going to save him $10,000 a month. Uh, we ended up having that for three years. My family got to come and work at the facility. We had an absolute blast. I had. Uh, four or five instructors work for me. It's interesting listening to Jason's perspective because Jason's perspective is from an employer. And so he's looking at not just what a golf instructor should do for themselves to be successful. He's really looking at what can that golf instructor do for me so that my business is successful. He'd love to have 10 instructors out there. And he would hope that they were all making $100,000 and were busy as can be. When I had my facility, I always had expectations on my teachers. I never charged, this is me, I never charged a dime for rent. And if you really think about rent, we used to not charge or pay rent when we were at facilities. But something happened. Either the owner said, I'm not getting enough money, and I get more, or they said, we don't know how much it is, and we're not being educated on how much the value of my instructors are. So somewhere in there, they said, okay, we're going to start charging a fee to the golf instructors. And that's how it had to happen. I can't take it another way why somebody also some sort of thinking. Uh, but if you really think about it, an owner provides you a place to make a living. So I used to pay for the grass, the fertilizer, the electric for the lights, the mats, in some cases the golf balls, equipment to wash the golf balls, all of those things. And I had expectations on my teachers because I was in business to make a profit. And so I knew that probably the most important people that could help me do that were my golf instructors. So I had five at the facility that I had, it's called Practice Golf Center in Memphis. It had a, uh, a restaurant and a bar also, which I subleased out. It was great because I paid a dollar a month um, I bought all the old equipment from the uh, from the uh, previous owner, and then sold parts of an automatic tee-up machine for that same amount, and then leased the food and beverage operation out for five thousand dollars a month. So it was five thousand dollars up before I opened the doors, and then I, I uh, sold the range balls and took care of all the golf. It was a nice situation. It didn't last long enough, unfortunately. That piece of property is still sitting there vacant. They never build homes because the home, uh, the housing market crashed, and the property. Uh, they took down the nets and everything on the property was sitting there vacant. So, as I went around and was involved in these golf centers, um, the, the market crashed, everything crashed, the economy crashed. I've seen about, in my lifetime, about three or four cycles of that. And some people owed us some money. We had a hurricane go through the golf course, we had a management contract on. Um, I was managing the property for somebody, and they came back and said, we want you to leave your company and come with us. I said, no, and they said, here's your last check. I got a lawsuit uh, with another group that owed us a couple hundred thousand dollars. 
I need cash. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do? So I'm going to go give some golf lessons on the side because I've still got some projects going. And so there was a regional manager for Arlen Palmer Golf, and I got to talk to him. He says, I've got a facility we're doing nothing. We do 160,000 rounds, 27 holes of golf. And I said, you guys aren't doing anything for construction. And so they said, we'll support you every way possible to build a program. We'll, we'll get you whatever you need. We think we can succeed with this thing. And I walked in, and it was an absolute gold mine. <coughs> I thought, okay, how do I start? Because essentially we were starting from scratch. One thing I found out was that we had 6,000 people in our parking lot. There was a business that had 6,000 people. Literally in the parking lot of this golf course of Southern California Edison, and I thought, man, I could just tap into those people. So I started some golf schools and clinics like we've talked about, very similar to Get Golf Ready, and I put a banner from here to the wall out, and it said, Group Golf Clinic, sign up. And as people drove out of the parking lot, they would see my sign. The problem was I wasn't really throwing out my schools very fast. So I said, how do I get to these people? So I heard they had a health program. Health, health, excuse me, a health program, and they required their people that work for them to participate in health programs. Health programs were Muay Thai, boxing, bowling, maybe yoga, maybe something else, those kind of things. And they've been doing that for quite a, quite a long time. So I got introduced to the guy that was in charge of the health programs, and I said, what about golf for health? Well, tell me why it's healthy. He's a non-golfer. And so I started giving him golf lessons for free, and I educated him on how golf could be healthy. And he goes, we can do this. Well, think about what I wanted. I wanted access to 6,000 people. The minute we created a health program, the minute I had access, that minute I had access to the database. So I could now put my clinics on the email, and email and, and the internet. This was back in the late 90s, and just really kind of getting going. <coughs> The minute I did that, I had instant access to 6,000 people, and I created this health program, and they had to be a part of the health program. It was a great opportunity. So I created 10 clinics per week, 12 students a clinic, which was 120 golfers a week. And I'd open up the book, and the minute it hit the water, the minute it went on the email, I'd answer 120 phone calls, right in a row, Sign them up, and then I had to start turning people away. Like, wow, did that work? I'm an absolute genius. It's like the greatest thing in the world. That was pretty simple stuff, really. Interestingly enough, once we did it at that facility, we did it at another Arnold Palmer facility. And then Arnold Palmer said, we want to connect with major companies. We want to piggyback on the marketing golf. So Nike Golf Clinics were around at the time. And I connected with the guy that was in charge of Nike Golf Clinics, and I got the uh, exclusive for Los Angeles and for the desert. And so we started doing the Taco, uh, the Tacos Creek Golf Course, which was in our own facility at the time. Then I had another owner in Los Angeles ask me to do the same program at another facility. And this thing just grew and grew and grew. The other way that I got it started was at Tustin Ranch, we started a golf expo. Now everybody does golf expo. I said, let's get all these vendors out here, put them on our driving range, and we'll let all the people that sell clubs have uh, the area where they hit golf balls that way. We'll put all of the uh, softwood vendors that don't need the driving range on the other side. And geez, the revenue we had that day was phenomenal. So at this Palmer facility, I said, let's go ahead and do that. We sold out all the booths, and I sat right on the side, and I gave three 10-minute golf evaluations. And the line was from here to from here to India. It was unbelievable. It was free 10 minute evaluations. The person would walk up and give them an evaluation and they would uh, and, and I'd say, you probably slice the ball pretty good, don't you? And the guy goes, yeah, how'd you know? And I mean, I was swinging like this. And I had him on video. And I'd say, yeah. I said, well, you know what? You slice the ball and here's the reason you slice. Hey, thanks for coming. And the guy goes, well, wait a minute. You gotta help me. You gotta help me out. I says, well, you know what? The lesson book's right here. If you'd like to set up, we can set up next day at 10 o'clock. So I started doing individual golf lessons. And 
then I brought instructors in for the group lessons because the group lessons were total beginning golfers, which was a perfect market. Because what did they need? They needed golf clubs, they needed golf equipment, they were going to buy food there, they were going to uh, spend money on range balls, they were going to do all that. It was a perfect market to actually grow our business. I'm on a plane, I'm sitting next to a guy, and it turned out to be a golf professional. I said, you know something we did one time, which was really cool? We provided a seven iron to everybody that signed up for the beginning clinic. I said, well, what's that cost you? He said, you know, we got seven irons for a week. We got a head, and we worked with a, a shaft company, we put them together, and it cost us $12 for all the time. He said, the one thing I found out was that that stopped people from running down and buying guns and buying golf clubs. And I went, really? Well, I was doing big problems. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I started doing that. And I literally had people say, you know what, I got my seven iron. On my next paycheck, I'm going to get my nine iron. And that's the people that we were actually dealing with. On my next paycheck, I'm going to get my nine iron. And then following that, should I get the wrench or should I get the five iron? Next thing you know, they were filling their sets in. Our club sales went up 200%. Our range volume went up 25%. Things were happening, and we were doing volumes. Uh, yeah, a couple of other things that we did, which made sense, was when new students joined our clinics, the next week they would come up with new shoes or they would come up with something else, new equipment. I thought, how do I stop that from happening? You know, I want them to be loyal to me. I want them to buy things from me. So we started handing them an envelope. I mean, first class, we had an envelope. And in the envelope were coupons, 20% off uh, golf shoes. 50% off a large bucket of keto, 10%, 20% off uh, food and beverage. We wanted them to be loyal to our facility. Next thing you know, we had, because it was in Los Angeles, we started having the Lakers come down, and then that attracted people also. We had uh, Oscar De La Hoyas to come in and, and actually uh, take some golf lessons there, and we would have a whole bunch of the Lakers would come in. Then all of a sudden, that started happening, and then it became, kind of became a place that really grew and grew and Interestingly enough, I was kind of pulled back into the private sector, which was really my background, uh, managing in the private sector. And lo and behold, I walked away from that. And uh, when I did, you know what happened to it? It dissolved. Nobody else came in, took the program over, and, uh, and kept it going. I said, wow, that's tragic. Because if you really look at Get Golf Ready, if you really look at player development programs, that's exactly what we were doing. We were growing the game of golf. It really was, uh, nothing to it was really scientific. It was all some pretty simple procedures. It was absolutely a blast to do. So the facility had night lights. When we opened a uh, golf range, there's a couple things we would never do. We would never build a facility unless it had at least 40 stalls and night lights. And there's some facilities that don't have night lights that are actually successful. Uh, but those were the two requirements that we had. We also had uh, requirements on, on track accounts, requirements on uh, school districts in the area. I have boxes of information on how to build driving range golf centers. If anybody ever wants to do it, my wife would absolutely love if you would ask me for some of that stuff. So I can get out of that garage. <laughs> Tom has provided me some uh, some information which I thought was interesting. This is from the National Golf Foundation. There's 25 million golfers in the country, and 89% of them, according to this uh, National Golf Foundation study, did not take a golf lesson. Let's just take 90 times 25. That's 22 million people out of 25 that did not take golf lessons. That's a big market of people that are available out there uh, uh, for opportunities. So, of those 11% that did, two thirds of those who take lessons are actually experienced golfers. So, who are we really teaching to? We're kind of preaching to the choir. We're taking advantage of our core golfer. Our core golfer is somebody who plays eight plus rounds. But we're really teaching to the people that have a great interest in. We're not capturing the 89% that are really beginning golfers that don't take golf lessons. Every employer I talk with right now, 
they tell me the same thing whenever I post a director of golf instruction or a teaching professional position. They say, Ken, find me somebody who wants to turn golfers into, or excuse me, students into golfers. Get them out of the golf course, get them buying rounds of golf, get them buying food and beverage, get them buying merchandise. When I think back on my career, I thought, you know, I had a habit of teaching a lot. Really working with students. Sometimes my focus was really creating golfers themselves. In those clinics that we did, I told you we did 10 clinics a week. The one thing that I did is I set up beginner, intermediate, advanced. So there was always something for a student to graduate to. It's too hard to find students, it's too hard to find investors. I was talking to Jason earlier. It's too hard to find investors one by one, one at a time, to build a drive around the shores. You want that investor to go out and find other investors for you. You want your students to go out and find other students for you. And, and how do women think? They want to do everything together. So they're your best candidate for bringing somebody else into your business, for sure. People want to be with their friends. Kids want to be with their kids. When I was doing my junior dove camps, I, when I did the Nike camps, I went back to Dove Canyon, I converted them to dove camps, and we did the bring a buddy. You know, bring a buddy was for two reasons. One, it was good money. Second thing is we found a kid wanted to do it with his buddy. And the second thing is it was another opportunity to bring family into the club and show them what membership had to offer. That's one of the things that I think every program should always consider is what is this carried over by Dog Lodge which has been so successful today? So consider that. 63% of those people identify themselves as nuts or hooked on golf. So we're really catering to the people who are <coughs> golf fanatics, really rather than reaching out and getting those new golfers to take lessons. That's what the group lessons do, and Jason just showed you uh, the value of what they Here's a couple of other things that we did. I don't know if people think, I don't know if you think about this, but a couple of ideas that we did. Connect with your local financial broker, your mortgage broker. I had a pain where a guy called me up and said, I've got 10 guys that will see me for 30 minutes if I offer them a free golf lesson. So 10 guys came up, I charged him $200 for the hour, and now he's got 10 guys, he's got 30 minutes that he can talk to about mortgage or financial planning. And then that carried over, and I ended up having about three or four of those. Uh, build your relationship with new home builders. We're starting to see new home builders um, uh, grow again. I was talking with Jason about this right now for this facility is a brand new track. How many of your instructors have gone down there and built a relationship with those salespeople and offered golf lessons to the people that come in um, or, or uh, get them on the database? One of the reasons that you might buy one of those houses because the golf course is there. Develop uh, health programs with corporations. I used to go to corporations that had a stage like this actually in their uh, lunchroom. And we used to put up a net and we'd actually hit wiffle balls out into the lunchroom and give a golf lesson. And that's how we would get people signed up for our uh, clinics. And it worked. Next thing you know, you had a line of people after you gave your little clinic up in front of them uh, signing up for your clinic. It was just all based on volume, volume, volume. Uh, Jason said database, database, database. I couldn't agree with that more. Volume, volume, volume. Co share programs with yoga instructors. I was just up at the La Pinata Country Club and they had a yoga instructor that was coming out to be in classes. And I said, why wouldn't you connect with that? Why wouldn't you go work for yoga and do something? We used to go down to Fitness 21 or any of those places and actually offer golf lessons. We'd put up a net and actually offer golf lessons as one of the services to people that joined Fitness 21. That was pretty good. We used to go to Las Vegas, put up a, a hitting net, and the builders would hire us at $2,500 for a weekend to give lessons all day in their hitting net to attract people to the group. So that was good money there. Database and constant activity. To me, we need to have 
constant activity in our facility. So when I had my facility, I would have something going on every day. If it was closer to the pin, if it was Monday night football uh, program, if it was a long drive program, if it was a women's free clinic, if it was whatever, constant activity. The other thing that I see is, is I always look for exposure. When I walk into a facility, I take a look and see what kind of exposure they have. We used to take our strategic spot where everybody had to walk through to get to the golf shop, to get to wherever. And we had a sign that was uh, uh, four by eight, and it listed all of our weekly clinics. And then every instructor had his tour bag on the range, and then they also had a sign that had a little brochure on their rates on how to contact them. Because when you're giving a golf lesson, especially an individual golf lesson, you don't have time to stop interrupt yourself to talk to somebody. So they can come by, grab one of your brochures, and then talk to you. But your presence on the range is really important. People need to see that you're available for golf lessons uh, and what programs you have to offer. I'm going to finish with this. I've got three things on PGA Links for you to help you with regards to instruction. The first thing is, is we, pro we post two different types of teaching positions. One would be a director position that oversees people, oversees a department, which is a director of instruction. That's going to be on career links. If you don't fill out your profile, you're not going to get that posting. So go in to PJ Links, click on employment, and fill out your profile. That's the first thing. Teaching positions, that's not a management position. Independent contractor status or teaching positions go on PGA job time, so you know where to find those. That would be one thing. The other thing is, is that there's an executive summary report for you to quantify your value. Just like the revenue scorecard for core development, you go on the employment department, it's set up exactly for teaching professionals. So you can actually quantify all of your value as a teaching professional. And the reason is because you should be doing that all year long, and you should be using that executive summary report to communicate with your employer or to commu uh, communicate with your owner and the reason is because that's going to lead you to the end of the year. What's at the end of the year or the beginning of the year? Your performance review. If I'm an employer and I'm an ed, and you're going to ask me for a raise, I've got to see results. And these are tools for you to be able to present results and what you've accomplished at your, uh, at your facility. That's the employment center part, and that's where those are. An example of the executive summary report, which is set up for golf instructors, and it includes a 30-day recap of what you've done, 30-day weather recap if there's weather issues, successes and challenges you had during the month, customer satisfaction, staffing report, and then what's ahead of us in the future, looking forward. This is the performance review. You can click on this. This is the golf instruction part. These are the areas that most employers are going to uh, evaluate you uh, if, for your performance. I would suggest, I'm glad Lawrence was here today, I would suggest that you go under the player development tab, and if you do that, click on the stories, and you'll find Lawrence's story of what he accomplished and how he accomplished it at his facility, as he told you today. You'll also see a host of others. And if you're one of those people that want to tell your story, um, get with Nikki, fill out the revenue scorecard with her, and then she'll submit that into National. She'll put your story on there as well. But read those stories because listening to uh, Lawrence is really valuable in determining how he was successful at his facility. The story is uh, under the player development tab. Independent contractor status, and I'll ask you. Independent contractor status, for those of you that are independent contractors, one, you need to make sure you're an independent contractor. For you employers that are hiring independents like you, you better make sure that you know what the, the uh, procedures are. Under the independent contractor status tab, you have uh, correct classification, common law rules, non-employee requirements, IRS interpretations, strategies for business owners, there's wage and hour information manual on there, and then a 
available to you is Gerald Stefanik, who is a wage and hour specialist. If you ever have any wage and hour questions, go to employment, PG Links, employment, click on wage and hour, Gerald's name comes up. Uh, we pay him to take care of you uh, and your wage and hour questions. That's available to you, there's no cost for his expertise. Now, excuse me, it's including you, dudes. there's a cost for his expertise. So use it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you.